This is the UK. This is the UK Financial Intelligence Unit podcast. Hello and welcome to the UK Financial Intelligence Unit podcast. My name is David Maguire and I'm a senior officer in the UK FIU. Today's podcast continues our series focused on fraud, and today we'll be looking at fraud intensification. So what do I mean by that? Well, in 2022, the National Economic Crime Centre, or NEC for short, with assistance from the City of London Police, implemented a period of intensification of activity across law enforcement. Now, there were a number of objectives of this intensification. To increase public confidence that law enforcement is committed to tackling fraud offending in the UK, to act as a deterrent through the promoting of successful initiatives to arrest or interview under caution suspects of fraud, to seize the proceeds of fraud and repatriate money to victims, and to increase confidence across government in law enforcement's commitment to tackling fraud. This work was positively received by law enforcement stakeholders. Iterations are in the planning stages for 2023. Here to explain this work further, we have Oliver Little, the Deputy Head of Operations in the National Economic Crime Centre. Now, Oliver, welcome to the podcast. Let's dive straight into this. So what is intensification in this context and how does it apply to work aimed at combating fraud? So fraud is a really broad area, but intensifications are a fantastic opportunity for us to increase impact on a specific type of fraud or enabler or to trial a tactic. So fraud is really broad. There are so many different types of fraud which people are perpetrating and categorised. So there's a, a huge amount of activity that goes on to combat that across not just the police, but across public and private sector. So this is an opportunity to to really improve the impact against fraud and I think that comes through to some of the public perceptions so I think almost all of us will have been targeted in some way for for fraud in some way and be aware of it and the profile of fraud is rising and rising because of those mass market tactics that fraudsters will use but I think the the perception may be that there hasn't been as many prosecutions against fraud as people might expect but there is a huge amount of work going on across the system, as we describe it, to combat fraud. But it's still a huge issue. Intensifications are an opportunity to raise the profile of that good work that's going on across the system and to try new tactics to have a bigger impact against the problem. So you'd mentioned that obviously most people in some form or another have encountered fraud. I was just going to ask, how much do victims lose annually as a result of this criminality? So that's a really good question to ask, but a really difficult one to answer. So we know that we have a national reporting service for fraud against individuals in the private sector in this country. That's Action Fraud run by the City London Police. And so that will typically receive about between 20 and 30,000 reports from victims every month, which is a huge number. Uh, But that is, you know, not everyone is reporting. And sometimes reports will go to other private companies as well. So another more reliable indicator might be the British Crime Survey, which says that 41% of all crime is fraud. And that's that's a figure that's rising. In terms of what's lost, we know it's billions. How many billions, we, we can't be sure of. But it's a, it's a huge amount of money that's being lost. And it, it causes devastation to individuals' lives. It puts the brakes on businesses. It impacts on our public services. And we've had some people in really desperate situations because of the money they've lost through fraud. And sadly, we've had some people who've committed suicide as a result of of what's happened to them. So it's really a huge challenge. And that kind of level of loss tells us that we need to have some really concerted collective action to combat it. Yeah, so in relation to that concerted uh, action, uh, you mentioned at the beginning about partners uh, working together. Uh, who are the partners in this intensifications work and, and how exactly do you all work together? So uh, I work in the NEC, but I'm a City of London police officer seconded to the NEC. And so the NEC is at its heart, it's a collaborative model. So it's got secondes from the core partners, so um, HMRC, uh, Revenue and Customs, 
Financial Conduct Authority, close work relationships with the Serious Fraud Office, and it's hosted by the National Crime Agency. So you've got some of the key public sector bodies there working together to understand the threats and to direct activity against those, those core threats. A huge amount of the investigative and enforcement response comes from policing, but also across those other partners. But another big part of what the NEC is doing, that's the National Economic Crime Centre, is you know building on this collaborative partnership model to work with the private sector as well. So we have that public-private partnership model in the, the National Economic Crime Centre. What you do there is you can bring together key people across the banking sector or the insurance sector or other areas so that we can pull that collective understanding of the threats and identify where we can target our efforts to have the greatest impact against the problem. Now, in collaboration with the City of London Police, last year the NEC implemented a period of intensification of fraud activity across law enforcement. I was wondering if you could tell us what did this actually entail and what was the outcome of this intensification period? So I think the first intensification period came with some really challenging deadlines. So this was an opportunity or an idea that we had to try and deliver really quickly at pace. So what we did was working really closely with the City London Police, went out to policing and said, you know, what is it that you can do uh, within March to really turn up the heat on fraudsters uh, and to improve the impact? And it was a, a really challenging deadline to set, but I have to say that the response was fantastic. Everybody got on board and uh, tried to up their game in, in various aspects. And that came in different kinds of ways. So for some people, that was about accessing funding to scale up an existing investigation. For some of them, that was about some of that intelligence that they just don't ordinarily have resource to look at, to look for the opportunities to have an impact. They could put some resource aside to focus on that. So you got some really interesting variations of approaches. And for some areas, they had wanted to try different tactics, and this was a perfect opportunity for them to try something new, to have an impact on the problem, to track, test and evaluate what the impact was. So some of that took in review of SARS analysis. Some of that was looking at more traditional intelligence. And as I said, some of that was existing longstanding investigations that needed a bit of a push to get over those last kind of bits of enforcement action, which brings, you know, it's often a great moment in investigation when you go through the doors and start arresting people, but you never quite know what you're going to find behind that door. And sometimes that brings extra elements of complexity and cost. So there was a really, really good response and a really interesting range of, of ways that people brought to, to localise this for their, their local threat picture. Now, I know an objective of the NEX is to deliver a consistent anti-fraud message to the general public, but how do you do this exactly? So I, I think it's it's a real challenge to try and both publicise the fantastic work that happens across policing and the economic crime system to combat fraud and protect people, um, but also get into um, people's consciousness, those core kind of protect messages, because, you know, we can do a huge amount to uh, investigate fraud and target persistent offenders. We also need to have a clear kind of message to the public to make sure they understand how they can protect themselves. So that's a bit of a twin challenge. I think in terms of the first intensification, what we wanted to do was to get local forces to publicise their achievements locally within you know, their local social media channels, their websites, across their local press, to get that message into the consciousness about, to highlight the fantastic work that was happening. So there was a, a range of approaches taken. I think as we've evolved, we've got different kind of communication strategies wrapped around each of the different kind of intensifications. So the one that we're in the middle of or towards the end of this February in 2023, as we're talking, again, we've gone with localised publicity by the forces about their individual operations. And at the end of that, there will be a kind of wrap up piece of communication that comes from the centre about this. You mentioned that the intensification work uh, to date has been uh, positively received by law enforcement and uh, further work is planned for 2023. Can you tell us a little bit about what's planned for this year? As, as we're talking now in February 2023, we're in the middle of another broad intensification. So 
if I kind of talk you through the, the intensifications we've run, we started in March 2022, and that was um, a kind of a, a push across the system to try and get as many people to localise their efforts. Across the, the rest of 2022, we did specific intensifications targeted about particular tactics. So we focused on looking at what is in that great pool of intelligence, um, the, the SARS database, to identify and test what the available opportunities there were and how we could improve reporter quality and how we could improve the law enforcement response. We then pivoted to look at investment fraud um, and test some tactics in October. And then in November, we worked to target money mules in using different tactics across um, two or three target areas. And that was in alignment with um, Europol's Operation Emma, which is um, Europe-wide money mules push. Into February this year, it's been, a, again, a case of asking everybody to look at what they could deliver locally, what are their local threats that their communities are concerned about, what are the intelligence opportunities that they're seeing that they can deliver against with this. And so we, um, we're towards the end of that. We've seen some fantastic successes again in February, and the numbers will be kind of coming out in a few weeks. But we're already into the planning cycle of asking our all our partners, OK, what are the future targets we can look for? So we have something planned for April this year, and we are still in those discussions with partners about what the future intensifications will look like. Well, that brings us to the end of this edition of the UKFIU podcast. I'd like to thank Oliver for taking time out today to talk to us. And as I mentioned in the introduction, this episode is one in a series of podcasts that the UKFIU is creating focused solely on fraud. Others look at a new communications fraud toolkit uh, aimed at coordinating a consistent and comprehensive response to fraud. And we'll also have a podcast focused on the topic of money mules. As with these podcasts, the magazines and other UKFIU guidance products, details of all of these are announced on the UKFIU's Twitter and LinkedIn pages. So I would urge you to follow us on there if you can. And also feel free to follow us on whichever streaming platform you use to listen into on these podcasts. So that way you're kept up to date as to when new episodes drop. I've been David Maguire. This has been a UKFIU podcast and thank you for listening. This is the UK. It's the UK Financial Intelligence Unit Podcast.